Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, for the next few weeks, I'll be preaching through 1 Peter, and I'd like to use this as an opportunity to go through the whole letter because it really is incredibly practical, especially for uh, the time that we're in right now. 1 Peter is one of two letters uh, passed down to us throughout history, which were authored by the Apostle Peter. Uh, Peter, you may recall, was a, a sort of leader among the apostles. He was often the first to speak up, and often he was also the first to stick his foot in his mouth. <laughs> uh, Peter was one of the inner circle among Jesus' disciples. He, along with uh, James and John, were allowed to see some incredible things that the other disciples missed out on. Uh, they were there when Jesus raised a dead girl back to life. They were also there uh, at Jesus' transfiguration, where he showed his divine glory and, and shined like the sun right there in front of them. Uh, we get to see some of uh, the high points in Peter's life as we read through the Gospels uh, and the book of Acts, like when Peter gives his good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, Jesus praises him and, and praises his confession as the very foundation of his church. Uh, we also get to see Peter as he, he powerfully preaches to, to large crowds in the book of Acts. But the interesting thing about Peter is we also get to see a lot of low points in his life. Like when Peter tried to, to stop Jesus from dying on the cross, right? Peter wants this relationship with Jesus to be all about glory and victory and getting everything we want. But, but no, Jesus says he's going to suffer and die. And in fact, the, the very thought that, that Jesus should not suffer and die makes Jesus tell Peter to get behind him. And, and, and Jesus even goes as far as to call Peter Satan. But that's the words that are coming out of Satan's mouth. We also get to read about another difficult moment in Peter's life when Jesus is arrested uh, and, and he's put on trial. And then Peter tries to be near Jesus, tries to see what's going to happen. But while he's there, three times people think or accuse him of, of being a disciple of Jesus. And three times Peter denies it. And then finally, Jesus looks straight at him and, and Peter runs off and, and weeps bitterly. Peter is a, is a fascinating character. And he's somebody that we can really empathize with, uh, but he's somebody also that speaks to us the very words of God. Uh, in Peter's first letter, he writes to a group of Christians that are going through some rather intense suffering. They're being persecuted for their faith. And the question is right there, if I'm supposed to be God's child, why is all this bad stuff happening to me? Surely the Almighty could make the circumstances of my life a little bit better than all of this death and pain and, and hardship. Well, Peter begins answering that question today as he speaks to us about our living hope. The letter begins in the typical way uh, for the Greek culture 2,000 years ago. Uh, whereas we write our letters with a dear person receiving this letter, then we have the body of the letter, and finally we sign it as the person who's writing the letter. Uh, back in that day, in that culture, uh, they would actually write first the name of the person writing, followed by the people to whom the letter is being written, uh, and then they would give the full body of the letter. And so Peter begins by identifying himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. We've spoken a bit about who Peter was, and that's valuable for us to remember, but it's also good for us to know what an apostle is. That word simply means someone who has been sent. In this context, the apostles have been specifically sent by Jesus Christ to proclaim the gospel of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. The apostles were given uh, unique gifts from the rest of God's people. They were given the Holy Spirit in a, in a unique way so that they could pen scripture. They could write it down, the very words of God. Much like the prophets of the Old Testament, only the apostles had the greater fulfillment of God's knowledge of God's word in Jesus Christ. Next, Peter identifies uh, his audience for us. And these are the original recipients. The, he writes verses 1 and 2 with these words. To the elect, temporary residents in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. 
Notice Peter's reference to the Trinity here, the Father, Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, now, we want to pay attention some, to something really closely here as Peter is writing. He's writing to just normal Christians. That is, Peter is writing to people who simply trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. But what does Peter uh, say about them? What does Peter say about you, Christian? Well, Peter says Christians are the elect. They are temporary residents in the world. This isn't our home. Everlasting life with God, that is our homeland. He says that Christians are scattered all over the world. He says they are chosen. He says they have been chosen by the foreknowledge of God the Father. That is, God chose them before the creation of the world. God knew them, not simply in a, well, God knows everything kind of a sense, but that God recognizes them as his special people. Peter says that Christians have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit has set Christians apart for something unique and special. They are set apart for what exactly? Well, Peter says here that Christians are set apart to be obedient and to to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that word for obedient is literally under here. As in, God speaks words to us and we place ourselves underneath those words. So absolutely, yeah, when God gives us his law, when he tells us that you shall not murder, uh, we're going to believe those words. We're going to agree with him that murder is wrong, and we are going to confess uh, any way that we might violate that command, whether by actually taking a life or simply by the thought of it with our own hatred. But all the more, we are going to believe those words that God speaks. We are going to place ourselves underneath what God says. And a perfect example comes in in Peter's next words there, that that this sprinkling with Jesus' blood. Here Peter is referencing some of the Old Testament ceremonies in which animals were slaughtered in place of the people. God was giving humanity the, the picture of another life dying in our place. But in some of those ceremonies, uh, the blood of the animal was sprinkled on the people. The blood covered over the sins of the people, the sins that they had committed against God, and it granted them forgiveness. In the same way, you and I have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not the blood of animals that covers over our sins. In fact, the blood of animals couldn't cover over sins back then. It was merely a picture pointing forward to Jesus Christ. But Jesus' blood, the blood of the actual Son of God, that can cover over all sins. That can bring us forgiveness and peace before a God who should righteously, rightly, be angry with us for our sins. But instead, God has granted us forgiveness. He has given us pardon and peace. And so we hear those words that God speaks, and we underhear them. We place ourselves underneath those words as true. We lift those words up as true. We believe that our sins are totally covered by the blood of Jesus. We don't think that, okay, yeah, Jesus died for me, but now I've got to do something extra to to pay for those sins, to really get right with God, to really be a Christian. No, we believe what God has said, that we are totally covered by the blood of Jesus. Next, Peter gives the customary greeting uh, from both the, the Greek and Jewish cultures. But as Christians, we can't help but notice the gospel in both of them. Not only do you have grace, but we have the grace of God who loves us even when and especially when we don't deserve it. In fact, he sent Jesus Christ to die for us, not when we had earned it, not when we had turned back to him, but he sent Jesus to die while we were still sinners, while we were still rebelling against him in our sin. Not only do we have peace, but we have the peace of God. We have the knowledge that God no longer considers us his enemies, because of our sins, but instead, through Christ, God considers us his beloved children. My fellow members of God's family, heirs of eternal life, chosen by God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, who have placed yourselves underneath the words of God and are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Grace and peace are yours, because God has given you new birth into a living hope, which we'll talk about more next time. God's richest blessings on you. Till we meet again. And I say, I say, I say, can't be there.